Hello and thank you for coming to uh, this session today. It's going to be all about how it's going to be a story sharing, experience sharing space where we have four guest hubs who will be talking about their experience and what they learned um, from their response and their hub's response to the pandemic so far. Um, so the hubs that we've got joining us today are Locavore, Health and Local Food Hubs, Stroud Co and Mercia Food Hub. And I'm going to pass around the table and get each of us to individually introduce ourselves. So I'm going to just start with me. I'm Kaylee. I'm in the OFN admin team. Um, and I've been helping hubs with their marketing and also facilitating these kinds of webinars. And so now I'm going to pass on to um, Ruth from Mercia, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Didn't know which way around you were going. So hi, I'm Ruth Redgate from Mercia Food Hub. And I've been operating for, where are we? Ooh, since 2017. And I'm going to pass on to Doro from Locavore. Yeah. Hello, I'm Doro from Locavore and uh, we're a community interest company doing lots of different things, trying to build a more sustainable food system, including shop, batch box and uh, some other things. Um, and we use the Open Food Network for our batch boxes. Great, thanks Doro. And now I'm going to pass on to James from Stroudco. Uh, hi there everyone. Yep, James here. Uh, we, I, I've been uh, running and helping to run Stroud Co for the last six or eight months. Uh, prior to that, I was on the board of it uh, for the previous couple of years or so. Um, we're a CIC and um, I'd be happy to share our story in the next few minutes. Great, thank you, James. I'm going to pass on to Al from Health and Local Food Hub. Hello. Yeah, I'm Alistair. Uh, Houston Local Food Hub has been running since uh, May of this year. So we started up sort of in the middle of, in the middle of lockdown. Great, thank you. So the way the session is going to start is with each of the hubs that are joining us talking a bit about their experiences um, and their story and what and the lessons that they might have learned from, from the pandemic. So it's going to be an open format. So I'm just going to share um, what their experience was. So I'm going to start with Ruth from Mercia Food Hubs, if that's okay, Ruth. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So as I said, my name's Ruth and I run the Mercia Food Hub. I've been using OFN for the last two years. And prior to that, I was with the Food Assembly. And I also run my own bakery businesses. So like most businesses, I was ticking along nicely and then lockdown hit. Two teenage children at the time, years 10 and 12, suddenly homeschooling towards their GCSEs and A-levels. A husband who worked for a bank and very quickly um, handling the C-bills that came out instead of the large loans. And I did wonder what was going to happen to my business. And then in week two, my orders went up by over 900%, with new customers increasing by 400%. Um, to say that was a learning curve was an understatement, as you need to bear in mind, there is just me. I have no volunteers, I have no employees, and my first reaction was, oh my God, what the, insert whatever expletives you wish to uh, insert, because you probably get them right, um, do I cope? But cope, I did. Um, I find reports on OFM that I'd never needed to use before, such as pack by customer. Um, my producers very quickly started packing by customer at their end. So instead of me having to split that kilo of carrots between customers, this was already done for me. Some producers had to be temporarily removed as they couldn't supply us for one reason or another, which was fully understandable given the circumstances, although equally frustrating that we couldn't continue to offer our full range of products. Um, I was still traveling to collect the veg and now coming home with a car overflowing cute teenage son. It was useful to have him at home and loading that with me on a Wednesday and then bless him helping me to reload that car on a Thursday for that collection point. We expanded our collection points and managed to secure one in a neighboring town that we'd been after for ages. So we now do collections on a Thursday, Friday and a Saturday and deliveries boy did those go mental i'd never offered them i still don't formally offer them in my local city but i advertised that i had limited space and that people needed to contact me before placing an order to see if i could accommodate them of course i always did and at that point although i didn't have any volunteers still don't have any volunteers i did have friends who were customers 
a local supplier and indeed a new customer who all offered to help with those deliveries. I saw constantly on the lookout for new producers and yes we did sign some up during the height of the lockdown which was also appreciated. As I said I've got two businesses so I was doing 12 hour days on both businesses and this increased to about 18 when it came to a Wednesday which is my baking day and I have got bread on the go while we're doing this and a Thursday my busiest day for collections. So I didn't get a chance to redecorate by the size of my next door neighbour, they knocked their house down virtually and rebuilt it. Um, but it was interesting, towards the end of lockdown, and also a bit demoralising to watch customers' buying habits change, especially with children going to school and people returning to work. They felt it was okay to return to the supermarket or manage to get a delivery slot from them. Yes, we are. And I think some quite a few food hubs are more expensive than uh, the supermarkets. We don't all have the basic essential items, although we do stock toilet rolls from who gives a crap. But we were there for them when the supermarkets weren't and that was the demoralising part for me. Some customers have disappeared altogether, others dip in now and again, and others still use us for the luxury items even explaining now that they get out, they've returned to the butcher and the farm shop direct. So at least they're still buying from local suppliers. We're now a slow food supporter and work closely with Slow Food Birmingham, sharing producers and they're sharing postage cost and reducing the carbon footprint for those items that cannot be delivered easily to the landlocked Midlands, such as fish. Only this week I've had a chance to revisit some of my producers that came on very, very quickly at the beginning of lockdown and revisit all their pricing and what we've listed. With regard to a second lockdown, whether that's national or local, would I do it all again? Yes, even with hindsight, I would still do those hours. I would still do exactly what I did when lockdown hit. It's my nature. It's what I do. I help people. Am I prepared enough? I'd like to think so, but until that second lockdown hits and what it impacts with, we will never fully know. But OFN throughout that has been offering us training, such as these webinars, and has also constantly been updating the system, which has been very much appreciated, not only by the producers and the hubs, but also by the customers. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, and uh, we've got space at the end for questions. So if anyone has any questions for Ruth um, from her story, if you could pop them in the chat or hold on to them till the end. And um, we're going to pass on to Thoro from Local Board to, to talk about her experience from the, from the first lockdown. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Ruth. Um, so we've been impacted in lots of different ways in our different parts of the business. Um, I'd say the least affected was the farm. They just kind of kept more distance at a purpose, but they were they all kind of spread out anyway. Um, the shop was incredibly busy during the first panic buying. Um, but the sales just went insane. I think before that, the busiest day we ever had on a Saturday was like seven grand and then it went to 13 and um it, it was just mental and it was it was good like we we did run out of toilet paper we did run out of stuff but i think we had things in for quite a long time and we, they came back relatively quickly as well so i think for many things it was like we were actually more available than the supermarkets around us so that was really nice to see um we uh made huge changes to the shop physically. So we had the, we had all the markings on the floor and we still have that in a one-way system and plexiglass and we ch completely changed all the shift patterns. So we made it that we had four different teams that only work with each other and there's no overlap. And then we changed the shop hours as well. So we'd open earlier, which I think is mainly to make sure that people have enough hours and to make sure we can get everything cleaned um but that means people at the moment start at six o'clock which i think is really hard going and i think everyone's looking forward to not doing that anymore um we uh 
what else did we do? The veg packing, we do we have a big veg box scheme and that also, that was kind of challenging to switch around because usually they're all standing really close together so they can all use the same, you know, veg. Um, that had to be completely redone um, and that also meant we had to cap how many veg boxes we could do. We stopped taking signups, we have a waiting list now. Um, so we couldn't actually meet demand. Uh, there was a huge demand for the veg boxes and we just couldn't do as many as people wanted just physically. Um, so that changed. We also, we just like 10 days before lockdown, we took over a cafe from friends of ours that wanted to move on. And then we ran that cafe for about 10 days and then we shut the cafe. Um, and it still hasn't reopened. We were thinking about reopening it, but Glasgow is now in a local lockdown and has been for like the past couple of weeks. So it's all shut again. Um, I think cafes technically can operate, but ours is in the city center, which is less, um, less of a great location now that no one's there. Um, yeah, we'd be doing a lot more cleaning. We closed in the middle of the day in the shop to clean. Um, and we, uh, we tried doing an online shop, which was, very popular initially but um the system we had for it wasn't good enough so we tried to have something that integrates our tools we wouldn't get the so we would stop selling stuff that we didn't have but it wasn't working well enough so it was kind of a bad experience for customers so we gave up and i think like we're going to get a new till system soon and then we might try again but we just stopped doing that it wasn't working um everyone that can is working from home um so I'm working from home, uh, the accountant's working from home, uh, the, the person that's managing wholesale is working from home, the people that do the veg boxes are partly at home and then do one day in the office um, a week. Uh, so, so like basically everything's changed how we do things and it was a real scramble and it was, it was really difficult to figure it out because there wasn't much information coming from the government on how to actually do things. So, in our experience, it was we would implement something first, and then eventually the government would, would follow. So we had the masks uh, a long time before that was mandatory. Um, what other changes did we have? I mean, the veg boxes became a lot more busy j just with the customers we had because we used the Open Food Network to um, do add-on sales so you can add your toilet paper or your orange juice or some pasta or tins and that became very very popular um, that's calmed down a bit now that people are a bit less scared to go to the shops um, but it's still that everything stabilized at a much higher level I'd say um, so yeah it was all pretty exhausting initially and I think now we've kind of found our new our new normal in it and it's feeling more manageable and just how we do things now and yeah and it's not as crazy as it was so it's so it's overall it's been really good um and i think yeah i think everyone was really exhausted but it's, yeah we're, we're all getting on better now and we're actually doing new stuff like we had a lot of things planned before the pandemic hit like we wanted to open a second shop and we wanted to take on a new market garden and both of these things are happening now. So, um, so, so yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's going all right now and uh, we're kind of getting back to doing stuff we wanted to do. So that's really nice. Um, what else? Um, I think overall it was, it was event pretty well for us and I think our customers really appreciate it having us and still do and are really supportive. I am really worried about what, what happens um, going forward with the furlough scheme because I know that lots of our customers work in the arts and um, you know and have jobs that currently don't exist or in cafes so um, it's kind of like hopefully they'll keep getting support from the government so they can keep buying our food that's something i'm worried about and then brexit of course especially with our wholesale business because we import stuff from europe there and it's a real worry that we'll have to pay um via, like uh, import duties and that would really bring the prices up um yeah i think overall the whole 
as a whole experience just confirmed that what we're doing is valuable. Like you should have resilient food chains and be close to your producers because they will look after you if you know if they know you. Um, so all the all the local farms kept supplying us, and I was, you know, and the, all our wholesalers kept supplying us to the best of their abilities. So it was really good, and it just kind of showed that if you have stuff that's where there's less steps between you and you know where it's come from then it's less likely to break down with a lockdown so it just kind of showed if to me it just kind of showed that yeah we, we should be trying to build a local resilient food system and just kind of keep doing that um yeah i think i think that's kind of me so thank you doro thank you for sharing and um now if James from Strauko, if you could share your, share your experience. Uh, yep, indeed. Uh, thanks, uh, both Ruth and Doro there. Uh, so Strauko is one of the first uh, OFN uh, hubs. Uh, so we've been part of it for, since about 2008 or so. Uh, I've been involved with it for about the last three years but only really in, in a director capacity, uh, um, nothing executive, if you like, not, not on the ground. And then come November of last year, we had a bit of a management change and um, we decided that we would suspend the service for about four or five months and reinvigorate it, uh, look at it again, probably change premises. And in the middle of that six months, along came COVID, which uh, completely changed everybody's outlook and uh, suddenly spurted us into starting uh, much more quickly than we had anticipated uh, with no premises, no staff, no uh, current supply chain. Uh, and all we had was, was uh, you know, a, a, a history and uh, a great set of ideas. So we went from naught to 60 in a very short time uh, the first point was to try to find premises and of course that was extremely difficult because uh, places were all shutting down uh, you couldn't um, well, you weren't allowed to go to some places and, and the places that might have been really suitable were out of uh, out of bounds really we were very fortunate and uh, found a place uh, in just outside Stroud uh, which we was happened to be very close to about five or six of our uh, historical suppliers, a place called Hawkwood, if any of you uh, know that. Uh, and that was really excellent. We were very uh, delighted that they were able to allow us to operate from there. And while we were there, we really did crack on to get a business which was running very quickly at three times or possibly even four times the highest rate that it had ever run in the previous uh, eight or so years. So that provided all sorts of problems. They've all been referred to uh, already by Ruth and to, to some extent by Dora as well. And it, it is a complete uh, slap in the face. You know, what do you do when suddenly you've got loads of people demanding your service and yet you've got to be there to to uh, deliver it without any uh, sort of ruffles. Um, we did all pull together, people came from far and wide. It was possibly um, made much simpler by the fact that so many people who were being furloughed from their other jobs were happy to work for free effectively as volunteers to, get to, to leap in wherever was necessary. Uh, and so th th there was a sort of crutch if you like in the form of those people that were uh, available but wouldn't otherwise have been uh, so we were turning over previously in the order of about six or seven hundred pounds uh, a week and it went up to way over two thousand in about three or four days of, of having reopened and it kept that up for the full length of um, spike one if that's what we can if that's what we can call it part of the um problems that we had to deal with were the shutting down of many of our suppliers so 
if we hadn't operated, it was a, it would be absolutely certain that a good half dozen of our regular suppliers who are all very fine small businesses in this area would have completely shut down and probably not started again. So we were delighted to be able to offer the service in order to support the supply chain. But equally, we were being called, as Ruth has already indicated as well, by heaps of people that hadn't ever called us before. Uh, so we, we <laughs> had a balancing act, which we were um, happy to, to uh, deliver on. And that really was the um, basis of, of how it operated for that first period of from March through till back end of June, July time. Um, we also had a new management team in place, and of course that uh, means you all know, getting used to each other and working things out. Uh, there was new members of the background team as well on, on the board of directors, if you like. Uh, so we were all hands to the pump and uh, kept things going. And then we had um, what you might call the half-time interval when uh, spike one kind of drew to a close and just before what we can now probably review, uh, view as spike two happening. Uh, and that was uh, interesting because our first set of premises were only available to us during the course of the initial spike. So that came to a close. The Hawkwood uh, College reopened and that meant that we had to find new places, new premises again, which we thought was going to be a complete pain, but in fact it was possibly a lot easier than we anticipated because there were other companies and other organizations, very much like-minded spirits to Sprout Co, not necessarily in the food business, but very much wanting to uh, preserve the community spirit and to work together uh, with us. So we're, we're now all in a new set of premises, which possibly has a much stronger basis than we uh, than we thought would be the case. Um, and that uh, was alleviated also by a uh, small grant that the local town council uh, offered us. They obviously going to apply for it, but they, they were very uh, keen to back the local supply chain. And that money was a couple of thousand pounds to be spread over two financial years has been very useful to get us into the new premises and, and sort ourselves out. Um, so uh, that, that would be one aspect, which I don't know, hasn't been mentioned before, but small grants from the local council are certainly something which uh, can be tapped into. Um, I think what it has been, it, things are definitely settling down and it's now probably settling down at, at twice the uh, amount of business that we've traditionally done at a kind of average pace. So it's, it's still very, very much busier than it ever was. And, uh, and that seems to be the norm. I think we can detect it's starting to rise again already. And that is great news. What, one of the um, points that I'd really like to make here is how the um, number of self-isolating customers uh, vulnerable people in some um, instances, but in many instances, just regular, probably slightly older uh, people who are absolutely unwilling to leave their front doors to go shopping, don't trust the supermarkets. In fact, in many cases, really live in places um, which the supermarket, traditional supermarket bought the van wouldn't even be able to get. And, and they are uh, absolutely um, reliant on other people's services and I think what we collectively uh, all of us sitting around the, the table here can offer is a friendly local service which is uh, harmonious with what people are looking for in, in, in the local area so we get great feedback from uh, these customers and, and, and a surprising number of whom are uh, not technically competent so other people often members of their family who, who didn't live anywhere near where we operate, I mean, maybe the other end of Britain or in London or wherever, uh, are placed the order on their behalf. So these sorts of so-called buddy type uh, arrangements 
uh, have proved really quite a, a new phenomenon to us and, and certainly are ones that uh, we're keen to work with local uh, community groups, council as well possibly, to try to access and find how we might be able to um, make that work a bit better. One of the partnerships that we've struck up in the last few weeks is with local pharmacies who also as probably happens where you guys all are uh, deliver pills and medication and so on to people on a very regular basis throughout each day and therefore there is some crossover at least there is with various pharmacies we've spoken to down here uh, in terms of the sort of person that they might be going to who might easily be the sort of person that might also want food delivered uh, but can't necessarily access it themselves. So those are two uh, two points. The other one is a, a, a relationship with um, bike delivery companies. Uh, so we have about a fifth maybe of our deliveries are made by bike. Uh, I don't know how well you guys know the Strive Valleys where we're based, but they're pretty steep and uh, you don't naturally want to come here on a bicycle um, so our hats off to them but this is becoming a uh, really good way of introducing younger fitter people possibly uh, into the work uh, field giving them something uh, responsible and and onerous in the sense that they're doing directly with the end customer and we are finding it an incredible boon that it's another aspect of the green delivery uh, network that we can tap into. A couple of the drivers have electric vehicles adding to that as well. So we're offering local food to people who are finding it difficult to get out, not, not all the customers of that, but with green deliveries. It's, it's making a reasonably good package to uh, offer as a, as a whole. Um, so what else have we been up to? Um, yeah, PR, that's another thing. Uh, Stroud, and, uh, Stroud is quite well known for having views and having uh, uh, lots of particularly food and uh, ecological um, opportunities within it. And, and the opportunity to tap into and to piggy, pig uh, piggyback on, coattail on those uh, things is very high. Uh, it's been a really good way of of us um, being able to reach new customers and to uh, sort of solidify the relationship with uh, existing customers. Um, so the next point that we're trying to do, I think Ruth possibly already mentioned this, that she has sort of what we call daughter hubs. So other, other sort of collection points, maybe in a separate village or a separate uh, place to us, uh, we're finding it quite tricky to be able to find the exact the sort of premises that that might operate best from because the traditional village shop obviously might view this as being fairly directly competitive to it and working with them is, is a possibility but sometimes a bit more difficult. So um, that's something that we're very much looking at and uh, as well as just newsletters and um, recipes and anything to uh, kind of integrate the food that we're being supplied with from the local suppliers uh, in a way which makes it more uh, enjoyable to have by the customers. Um, I think that's probably probably me. Great, thank you James. Um, to say we've got a couple of questions in the chat, um, so thanks to everyone who, who puts questions in, that's amazing. Um, we're going to postpone them just until after um, Al from Helston has shared his story and then we'll have like a nice um, Q&A session which will be a bit more interactive, but for now um, Thanks again, James. And Al, if you could um, share your story, that would be amazing. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to share my screen as well, if that's okay. Um, can you see that? Okay. Yep, that's, that's visible. Great. Thanks, Al. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, I've forgotten that. It's a slideshow. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm probably, Helston's local food hub is certainly the new boy compared to um, the other ones we've just, Stradco and 
Ruth and Dora's that we've been hearing about. So um, the background is really that we had a successful farmers market in Helston since 2008, but we can never work out how to get local food more available to people more often um, than the monthly market, which we just couldn't do more than one just that monthly market. And I had heard about Stroudcare, and that was a bit of inspiration, really, as, as to how the Open Food Network could help us fill the gap between those markets. Um, uh, and I had started to talk to people because I'd, I'd, um, my circumstances changed. I left my job, and I had a bit of time. So in February, I started talking to our producers at the market about, the, about uh, running a local food hub. And there was some interest in that. But of course, then COVID happened and there became a lot more interest uh, in that all of a, all of a sudden. Um, so we needed to move quite fast. I think where I was probably planning to set up a community interest company uh, and gather some other members of the team, volunteers, et cetera, alongside it, I pretty much just started running it myself. So like Ruth, I'm sort of running, running the Health and Local Food Hub. Um, mostly on my own, but with some help from Helston Climate Action Group volunteers. So we started with Helston Farmers Market producers uh, early on. Uh, about 10 of them joined. Quite a few of them were had in the, in the sort of few weeks or, or the month or so before we, we got going, had found their own ways of reaching the local community and some, some quit almost immediately and um and some were shielding themselves they couldn't uh couldn't uh carry on um but we had 10 who were interested and and since then we've grown to probably about 16 17 um producers now so we're setting up from scratch uh we didn't have any premises we don't have any premises we we sort of rent the space that we have, but it is a really great space. It's, it's, a, it's an old cattle market building. Well, it's an old cattle market. It's called the old cattle market. It's not old, it's brand new. Um, it's on the site of the old cattle market, but it's big. And it's where the farmer's market took place itself. So there's actually, really, there was really loads of space because it wasn't being used by anybody else. Um, and we had, I'm going to talk about family volunteering. I suppose we had a big, we had a big space, so social distancing was really easy. Um, and actually we started with two sets of two people doing the packing and everything, but they were two separate families, so we were we could work we could work separately, but two people could work close together, which really really helped. Um, and I had yeah, under advice from others, I limited my first orders to twenty. I think they we got to twenty so fast. I think I thought, oh we'll just let it go to twenty five or something. Uh, but I made the mistake of going for a walk at about six o'clock and three quarters an hour later, um, we'd gone up to 30, so I sort of stopped there. But actually that was you know, probably still the most successful day. It was the first day, because I think we have a quite, we have, we have almost matched it to go, but that was, that was the biggest day because people had been, had been waiting um, and hadn't had access to that local food. Um, so in terms of, um, I suppose what I just want to talk about now a little bit was I think what was what really starting from scratch I didn't really know what I was what I was doing so um, uh, so I set up the well actually I'll, if I move on to the next slide because I think we don't really need to look at the paperwork so much but I, I guess what went well and this was the first thing stealing a phrase from my previous organisation I worked with but stealing with pride. Um, I really use the OFN weekly support webinars, and I re and I really lent on lots of other food hubs to help me with their um, or to send me their policies and procedures and things like that. So I think probably James, you might recognise that health and safety policy there is probably pretty much the Stradco one with a few little amendments uh, on on the top. So um, I think in terms of advice to other people starting out is get whatever you can off other people and, and amend that to your own um, 
to your to your own needs because just knowing that this is what you need is an example um and for me not having done anything like this before i think um carol from stradco sent me their sort of what we do each week and that was absolutely invaluable because i could just okay on monday i need to do this on thursday i need to do that and uh, and that's who i need to involve at each point so that was super helpful and just things like procurement as well so finding out where to get insulated carrier bags from um just just meant that i was able to get going much more quickly and be much more effective when i did um so and the weekly sport webinars i was um i was a very regular attender at all of those um once once i'd got got going with it because it was it was really helpful to hear from everybody else and um and work out what was what was going on it was yeah and it was a bit of sort of it was hard it was really hard work setting it up and it just really helped to know that other people were going through the same thing i think the in terms of what the other thing that really helped was the scheduled connection times that the um that the software was allow, allowed us to do because that just meant people weren't all arriving at the same time people were arriving with um a bit of space between them they weren't having to queue um and that re that really helped um i got early on i got in touch with our environmental health officer who again was was really helpful um uh and i suppose that sort of gave me the confidence that what i was doing was was working uh what I'd set up was was going to work and was going to be safe and um, and not cause us any any issues at all. So, um, so I didn't go down the delivery route. Um, it's something that's sort of been in the back of my mind ever since we started, really. But I just couldn't physically uh, couldn't physically do it. So what I did set up was a couple of community collection points uh just in people's car parks in a, uh, in a car park of a cafe and in the local village car park um that's another place and i suppose they've worked they've worked pretty well and um and i suppose one of the points i'd, I'd, I'd make here about um uh, whilst it doesn't help people who are really isolating lots of people were quite isolated anyway and i think actually some of those well both those collection points have become a bit of a community focal point and people were saying at the first ones people were, people were meeting who hadn't seen each other for weeks because they they um they'd been in in the houses or you know not not going anywhere so um so that the community collection point certainly had a, had a real um, had a real value over and above um, just the collection of the, of the food, um, and I think all of all the things that I set up with the health and safety policy, with the with the um, the plans and the procedures that we went through that I had borrowed from everybody else, um, I got a lot of feedback early on. Um, people that it gave them the cut the confidence that we were doing things safely and certainly i can remember a few people coming the first time looking really worried because they didn't know what it was going to be like and was it going to be like a supermarket was it going to be uh crowded and busy um but when they saw the space that they were allowed the space that they were given the lack of queues and and general busyness um that gave them a lot of confidence to come back again and actually confidence to 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 go out shopping i think so um i think in terms of uh suppose issues for me in terms of uh, the second lockdown or, or the continuing issues around covid one is as a sole trader or so you know running this on my on my own um it's pretty fragile and a little bit i Bit vulnerable. I have got I have got help from from volunteers um, who can step in. But if um, if I catch a fever from you know I've got kids at school, it's going to happen at some point. 
um, then I'm going to have to isolate for a bit and, and uh, what happens then. So, so I uh, suppose getting procedures in place for that sort of eventuality is, is, a, is a, a prior, well, yeah, I've got it, I've, I've got it resolved, but it's, um, uh, I need to be sort of sure and secure about that. Um, I suppose I'm thinking about, there are a lot of other food delivery services that have set up locally in it over the over the course of the summer and i suppose i'm trying to work out what my place is within that and my place is within those local communities where there are shops and other means of, get, of getting food so i'm i'm also 100 clear on that but um i need to sort of work that one through and and i suppose i'm thinking also about how to get to those those people who are who are self-isolating, who are feeling vulnerable and don't want to don't want to leave the house and how we can we can provide some sort of a delivery service or some means of getting those people who can't come out to our collection points um, to get to give them access to the local food that we're that we're offering. Okay, okay, that's um that's me. I'll stop sharing. Great, thank you, Al. Brilliant. So thank you so much, um, everyone, for sharing your stories. It's been really fascinating hearing such kind of varied experiences, but also with very some very similar points coming up. Um, so we've had some questions in the chat and we're going to open now to a Q&A session, which Louise um, from the OFN admin team as well is going to facilitate. Um, so handing over to Louise. Hi. Um, yeah. There's some questions in the chat and I think some of them might have been answered while we've been going along in the chat, but I just, um, I know uh, Ruth asked Dora a really um, interesting question to start off with about, um, do you want to ask that again, Ruth? And then we can just, everyone can hear the answer in case people haven't read the chat or found the chat. Yeah, no, um, I was very interested when Dora was talking about the extra hours that they've done in the shop and starting earlier how that had affected their volunteers stroke employees especially for any that had to self-isolate and what impact that had yeah and that kind of reminded me that i hadn't talked about that at all <laughs> um so yeah we've been really lucky because we do um so many different things so we have lots of things that happen that aren't actually all that uh, customer facing or contact intensive so what we ended up doing is that everyone where we thought where we knew that they were vulnerable or where we were kind of worried because of age or medical conditions that we were we had a chat with them and uh redeployed everyone to other bits of the business if they wanted that um so we added more members to the vegbox admin team which was obviously taking off so and then you can and they got to do that from home and um and then we had two people that did the online shop packing shifts, which were after the shop closed, so they didn't have to interact with customers. And they ended up getting followed for a while. But now that um, we've been kind of dealing with the situation for a while and we didn't have any outbreaks of anything, we've kind of been feeling more secure in what we're doing and that our measures are working, like the distancing, the plexiglass, the one-way systems, the kind of we didn't do loose goods for a while and we just pre-packed everything and we just kind of felt actually this is working and people felt confident as well to come back so this the furlough people are now back and also what i forgot to mention is the cafe that we had for 10 days we mentioned we managed to redeploy everyone there to the shop mainly to pre-pack loose goods um which is now changing again but but yeah it was really it was that was really lucky that that was really possible awesome. Thank you, Doro. That's really interesting. Um, Rachel, you had a question for James. Do you want to ask? I think um, you might be still muted, Rachel. Oh, you, um, Sorry, there we are. It's okay. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned local council grants, James. Um, can you give an overview of, of what do you use that for? Was it for the rental of premises or for something else? Um, it was 
ostensibly offered right at the beginning of COVID. So it was designed to assist uh, uh, any applicant to address uh, COVID related or likely COVID related problems. It was probably um, March or April or sometime that they were offering this. So it was very early. We, it was very, very difficult to predict what was going to happen. Uh, when, when the grant was actually paid, which was probably uh, the back end of April or maybe the beginning of May, even, um, which, which happened to be our financial year, so that was quite uh, fortunate, uh, we, they, they sort of relaxed the conditions a bit more. And um, what, what they were trying to do was to ensure that there were no uh, uh, sort of gaps in in a market which was already being created particularly from the supply chain side they were very concerned that and it was true uh, there were dozens of, of small shops obviously closing down but uh, um, farms and farm shops and suppliers who you don't regularly see but who are in the background supplying restaurants pubs all the things that were closing down they were themselves facing uh, a pretty bleak future so what the Stride Town, Town Council was doing was offering uh, ways of us devising ways of ensuring that we could maintain the service and keep the supply chain uh, going as best we could. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. James, um, can I run through all the other questions and then if they've got other questions at the end we can come back to them. I just want to give everyone time who's already put a question in. Is that okay Rachel? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, Sarah, um, you asked, uh, you had a question for James. Um. Yes, uh, James, um, I'm a country market, Ulster country market, and um, we started up our shop on OFN in about July, so we missed all the uh, lockdown time. Um, we are finding it quite difficult to get orders in. People seem quite resistant to it. And I was wondering if the fact that you deliver your goods to people, do you think that's absolutely essential to your success? Uh, in a brief word, yes, I do. Uh, we completely stopped collections throughout the period from March to uh, August and we've only reintroduced collections uh, since since we moved premises for the second time in uh, back end of August. Uh, it now forms a strong but still quite small portion of of the orders that we uh, get you know the orders that come in. The delivery is by far the most popular and I would say increasingly will remain so because of the self-isolation aspect and the um, ability for people to uh, you know just just get get the orders in as you know at, at, at a time that's convenient to them and um how did you find your people to deliver okay so during the first part of the covid uh, as i mentioned there were lots of uh, spare people in the sense that they were all absolutely fine and healthy and, and so on but were being furloughed from whatever job it was and therefore they were not allowed to earn money directly through that line of business but they were able to earn money on a part-time basis or, or at least uh, have costs covered and so on uh, so we we were um, inundated I think it would be a fair word to use by people who were in that position so these were tended to be people in their maybe in their 20s uh, and uh, were, were quite uh, up for, for assisting in almost any uh, capacity. Since then it's definitely tailed off. I think maybe Ruth mentioned this right at the start. People have uh, tended to go back wherever they might have been uh, from initially or working and that num the numbers have gone down but um, you know, there's still a core number of people there who are, who are uh, willing and wishing to um, join join in and assist in, in a community project, really. As the volunteers? 
Yeah, they're all volunteers. That there is no way that an organisation of our stature can actually make payments in the traditional sense with all the incompetent NI and all the rest of it. And obviously, as I'm sure you're all aware, any form of cash to a volunteer runs the risk of them being treated as an employee. So we uh, we obviously re um, compensate for any. Uh, mileage for any expenses, uh, all the norm, normal things there. Um, plus, we give a discount and uh, free delivery and so on on orders placed. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, thank you. Charge um, for deliveries on the OFN website when people order, there's a, a delivery charge added on, is there? Yes, you can, uh, you can t uh, make a number of different types of uh, charge and you can just tag them with a different um, application. So maybe charge one pound for this type of customer and three pounds for this one or five or whatever the figure is. And then you associate that charge with a particular customer. So that's what comes up every time they place it in an order. Okay, well, I must, I must investigate that because this is our big problem is getting people and I'm sure that now the weather's getting bad, we need somebody to deliver and our orders will increase, I hope. Well, I would really seriously believe that would be true. Yeah, certainly, as you say, as the as the nights start to get earlier, it's uh, definitely a, a, another a helpful factor, I think. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I wonder whether there's any um, other any other, others of the hub managers, um, well, the speakers who'd like to contribute to this. I think, Ruth, you wanted to say something about deliveries and how they've um, helped. Or yeah, so I've also got a country market hat on as well as the same as Sarah. So, but with the Mercy of Food Hub, we have found as well deliveries have made a huge difference. But then if I put my country market hat on, I'm having the same problem as Sarah with getting people to order because it's completely alien to our customer base. But what we're starting to do is we're starting to prepare our customers who are coming in and taking their contact details now ready for a lockdown. We hope we never have to use it. They're conscious that we do do online. They're not prepared to use it at the moment, but the way we're handling it is taking their details now. Should it happen, we will then contact them and deal with it that way. We're also fortunate that we have two, three, four, possibly five of our members who would do those deliveries because they have the business insurance already. And that's the other thing Sarah would have to start looking at to make sure any of the members who are doing it had business insurance on their car for a start off. Um, we've also had advice from elsewhere that we shouldn't potentially be charging for delivery. Um, Sarah and Susie will know exactly who I'm referring to. Um, I don't actually think that's right. I think we should be charging for deliveries. Um, it may be we do a very small area that's free. And outside of that, you then start increasing it, which is what I do in my own business. But whatever is coming from our head office, I think we should charge and customers expect to pay because they do from a supermarket. Hope that helps, Sarah. Thank you, Ruth. Candice, um, you had a question you'd like to ask one or all of the speakers. Would you like to chip in? Sorry, it took me a while to unmute myself. Uh, yes, um, a number of uh, your speakers today have, have mentioned an increase in sales really early on. And I was just wondering how they um, got that word out there that they were starting this new service. Um, to, uh, particularly, you know, how did they get those that nine hundred percent increase? And well, you know, if they got any tips on how they marketed? Okay, so that was me with the nine hundred percent increase. Um, I'm fortunate; I have a very large newsletter that goes out. Not everybody orders from it. Um, social media is a big one, word of mouth. But I'm also part of our local um, best of um, franchise, which does operate up and down the country, not in every area. And they have a massive newsletter that goes out weekly and we are talking in the thousands. And that's where most of my customers came from. Um, but if you can hit, it comes down to the, the basics. Social media is free, use it. It doesn't matter if it, ideally frequently, but if it is just once in a while, it will eventually drip feed and people will find you. 
I, I'm wondering from um, with your experience at Helston, you'd have any advice because you, you're a similar situation. You sort of started up from scratch. How did you get the word out to your customers that you'd suddenly started um, open online trading? I think it was Facebook in the first place because we had the Helston Farmers Market had an established Facebook. Um, with, yeah, we've got a thousand or more followers. So I use that a lot uh, at the beginning and probably actually should still still carry on using it. So most of my initial customers were Houston Farmers Market customers. Uh, I think from then, I'm going to do a little customer survey uh, a few weeks ago. And from that, the two most effective means were word of mouth and, uh, and Facebook. So I'm very, I, I've done a couple of press releases through the um, over, over the last six months, and not many people um, seem to have picked up from it through through that. Um, and I think over time, I've had, I'm, on, I'm getting a few every week. I get a holiday maker or two because we're in Cornwall, um, and they've done, they found it through just a Google a Google search looking for local farmers markets or something like that. So. I think all of those things, but certainly word of mouth feels the most effective. The newsletter is absolutely essential. I see there's, there's a question later on about holding on to people. Um, and I think certainly the, the, the newsletter, which I must do my Wednesday evening newsletter in a minute. Um, I know, I hope there will be, a, there always is a flurry of, of orders um, as soon as I've done that. So that's very, that's, you know, that's a way of keeping hold of customs, customers. Thank you, Alistair. That's really interesting because it leads into John, uh, Jonathan's next question. Do you want to ask um, the others, Jonathan? Certainly, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here in Penzance, so I've had a few email exchanges with Alistair, although this is the first time we've encountered pixel to pixel. Um, so I've had a, like a long distance interest in, in food hubs over the last decade, I suppose. And there's always been resistance here in Penzance. Uh, people sort of saying, oh, well, we so enjoy meeting people at the farmer's market or whatever. Maybe I'm on the Asperger spectrum or whatever. I've never, ever been a customer of the farmer's market myself, although I do get a veg box. But, but uh, I mean, it seems to me that the pandemic has offered this enormous opportunity to uh to kind of push people into making use of things like this and and I, it just feels like we really need to be on top of how to keep them after the pandemic is over i think that that is my concern so hence my question um who would like to answer that i think um i'll this is alistair suggested that newsletters were really yeah. important um, and deliveries, really. I, yeah. I think that. Uh, what about Ruth? What would you What would you think? I think this is something that you were mentioning a bit to begin with that you were worried that people had sort of slacked off a bit. Um, yeah, I think um, I think we'd all agree we expected to lose people as supermarkets reopened. Um, probably not to the extent that I have. Um, but what I've also found has been really useful is that my collection points. People have used it as a networking opportunity. And every so often I will put that in my newsletter that so-and-so is connected with a copywriter, has done this, has helped a school out. And it's interesting that then starts to get more people coming out of the woodwork for a while because they're fed up of face to face, uh, they're fed up of Zoom networking. So if they suddenly realise that they can come along, pick up their food, do some face-to-face -face networking in the car park, all safely distanced and everything, that's another avenue for them. And that has worked quite well. Partly, I could do with a second lockdown. And I know that sounds really strange, but people used us, they tailed off. And I think to get it back into people's mindsets that we're still here, we could do with a second lockdown. Okay, I've put it out there. <laughs> I'm just gonna jump in here and tell everyone that it's now half past five, um, because we've got a really good question session going on. Um, we're going to extend for another 15 minutes, but I'm just offering this opportunity for anyone that needs to leave, including our speakers. Um, if anyone needs to go now, perfectly welcome to. Um, 
will only extend for another 10 to 15 minutes maximum and then I'll close things down. Uh, so just putting that out there to everybody. And thank you so much for all the brilliant questions and answers so far. Um, yeah, so um, Doro, did you, would you like to, do you have any advice for um, Jonathan about the, how you manage to maintain your customers? Because I think, are you, sort of Glasgow is in a, a second lockdown now, is, as, isn't it? Is that sort of seen things increase again or has um, that not happened? Uh, no, not, it hasn't really increased it to a huge degree, I don't think, but I haven't seen the very latest figures for like this week and last week where it really started. Um, but I think, I don't know, I, I think we have like with local we've always seen lots of dips around like you know we have a huge influx of new vegetable customers in january where they make good intentions and have their you know and want to eat more healthily from now on and then they all tail off um when the hunger gap hits so i think i'm, I'm kind of used to these you know people have this reason to join and then they try it for a while and then they it tails off again and obviously with the, with the New Year's resolutions, you have to think that do come around every year, so that really helps. But I think it's just, what it does is even if people don't end up being customers for every week, forever, they become aware of us. And then the next time they might, you know, even if they don't regularly get something, they might at some point go, oh, that was useful. I might do it again. And we do find that, you know, things drop off, but they drop off to a higher point than we were before. So, um, I'm not hugely worried about it, but we're also in this luxury position of like having both of these things really well established, like a well established shop and a well established veg box scheme where, you know, once you have people in the veg box scheme, you do keep them for a while. And that's so, yeah, I'm not sure if that's useful. <laughs> Thank you, Dora. Um, I think Alistair's going to have to leave in a minute, so I just want to take this chance just to say thank you very much for attending, Alistair, really appreciate it. Um, and then, uh, just to, sorry to be on to the next question to fit everyone in, um, but thank you very much. Um, Rachel, do you want, you had a question you'd like to ask? Um, it was just thinking about the, the delivery um, issue that people were talking about, just thinking, from a different direction really you know if i was going to a pickup point and i was going to pick up my order i'd be quite happy to drop off to a couple of people on the way back and is is there any mechanism that ofn supports that or um has anyone tried it in in some way and is there any implication for like you were saying needed um business insurance if it's going to be part of the business but i'm not thinking of anything quite so formal just um you know just helping out people okay if it's a friend or a neighbor that you know you could have the arrangement beforehand but if it's strangers is there a way of connecting people up like that um just jumping in here a little bit uh, rachel because um i do the admin and so i know that this did come up for some hubs um because i've encountered questions and I know that certainly during lockdown and the months afterwards um, quite often neighbours will get together and they'll do separate orders but then they'll put a note on the order and then the hub can see that um, only one of them's coming up to coming to collect the, the goods and you can see that if there's a note on the order. I haven't heard of anyone do it sort of um, pair people up with strangers for um, who might live nearby but they don't know. I don't know whether um, Ruth or Doro or James have any um, have ever encountered that or no. Well, sorry, who's talking? Yeah, James. <laughs> um, we have something called group orders, which is where uh, the customers, various customers, up to five, I think it is, or maybe six, can tag themselves as one group, and then any member of that group can order with a lower delivery charge because we deliver the up to six or five, whatever the number is, um, customers orders to one central delivery point, which is going to be close to where they all live. And that seems to work uh, quite well. It, it certainly happens on a weekly basis um, that, that one central point is used as the pickup point for five or six other people. And that 
because it's easier for us to do the delivery, it, we charge considerably less per uh, delivery. So everybody um, wins out if you do that. Okay. If I could just add a couple of points to the previous point there as well, actually, Louise. Um, sure. Just three quick points. I, I certainly agree with Doro that um, what, what we see and what generally happens uh, is that when there's an uplift, it does tail off, but it tails off to a higher uh, point than you were at at the beginning before the first uplift. Uh, and that, that happens on a, a, you know, it's called the step process. It's quite a well-established kind of trend in, in uh, businesses like we're all running. Uh, and it certainly has happened in, in during lockdown. So I, I would suggest anyone that uh, manages to see an uplift in their business is that yes, it will drop off, but probably not to the level it was at before. And then two quick things, partnerships are really crucial things here. We, we've, uh, I think I mentioned the pharmacy one that we've uh, established, but there's another um, uh, organization called Long Table, which makes um, meals out of surplus food in the Stroud area. And they've got a whole uh, panoply of different people that use those services. And they are very keen to team up with us so that we can act as a kind of delivery arm and also offer their food out there. They're trying to team up with other people who've got a similar sort of outlook and a similar kind of need to your own is another way of assisting uh, growth. The third point is try to use your suppliers. We've all spoken about ways of uh, uh, flyers and the social media, which predominantly go out to the customer base. But actually, if you speak to the suppliers, part, part of what we're all doing is backing and supporting the local supply system, uh, trying to get them to uh, spread the word through their own networks is another way of reaching their new clientele. Thanks. Thank you, James. That's really interesting. Ruth, you're about to jump in. Do you... Um... Yeah, um, just to add to that. One of my suppliers, not with me, but with another food hub that he works with, which is not an OFN, he actually does deliveries on his way home after he's done his drop. So you can actually, if you're lucky enough, producers might do that if they've got people on the way home. So don't just think about the customers doing it as well. That's really inventive. I wouldn't have thought of that. It's no. like, this is, this is so like, this is so like why it's really good to have these sessions. Right, we've got another um seven minutes max is there any questions because like please anyone jump on me and jump in now because i think i've read out all the questions in the chat um uh, I don't... sorry i'd quite like to ask one question about uh, community uh, sorry collection points uh i think several people have mentioned that they have collection points ruth i think you were one of them Do, does this mean that there's a sort of dedicated, do you, do you go there with a bunch of different customers' orders and wait for them to pick them up from you? Or do you leave them in a, in a place for them to come to themselves? Both. I misunderstood. No, both. Um, so I've got my dedicated one in Litchfield, which is my original one on a Thursday. I go, people come and collect. Um, I've been trying to get the neighbouring town, Tamworth, and that genuinely came out of um, a closed Facebook group for that area when I was advertising. So I, I go and stand in the, the car park of a restaurant there. But unfortunately, two of my producers on a Saturday will act as collection points. My butcher will act as a collection point and my cheese gin and ale shop will act as a collection point. So I go and drop customer orders off there and they then deal with them for me. Ruth, is there any implications um, on insurance for that? With the businesses doing it? Yeah. Um, no, because they're all food based anyway. Um, so as long as I've packed everything up correctly, so they've all got fridges if I need to use the fridges, they've all got freezers. Yeah. Um, so everything's covered that way. So we're okay on insurance and stuff like that. Okay. Um, Louise, I'm sorry if I'm going off on a tangent slightly here but i just wanted to quickly ask we're very new and um, we open next week for the first time um, and i'm just currently scurrying around trying to find the right insurance and i'm trying to work out 
do I need to have insurance for the stock or just public liability and employers liability insurance? Does anyone have stock liability? I don't hold stock. Um, I well, I mean, would not. I'm, I'm not planning on holding stock only just for the few hours between drop off and whatever. I don't have it. I'll be honest. Um, for that reason because I'm literally holding it getting rid of it if I was in the old days I used to hold stock for some companies like Hodme Dodds I still didn't have it then um should I have done I don't know I think that's the risk and that's a judgment call you have to make but your public liability definitely and your employer volunteer yeah. if you've got so many sure yeah uh, again, if I can jump in here, Rachel, the um, I think the answer is probably no. I mean, you have to have a, uh, a decent amount. amount of stock to make it really worthwhile. There'll, there'll be a, an excess for a start, so you know you wouldn't get even get a small amount of stock covered if it was damaged or taken. The only uh, um, exception to that would be if you're selling alcohol, but obviously you need to have a license for that in the first place. So that all becomes a different kettle of fish. Well, I think you've mentioned a couple of times questions about business um, insurance for drivers. You do have to have that, but in most of the experiences that I've had over the years, it is not really any more expensive. It's more a case of saying to the insurer, I sometimes will use my car for a business usage. It doesn't really add anything more to the premium, it just covers you okay. with a problem. Yeah. Uh, if you would like, I can sh uh, share with you uh, the name of our insurance company or our insurance broker who is very helpful in... Yeah, I would, I would really appreciate that, actually. Okay, well, I'll get your details from uh, Kaylee or whoever and then forward them to you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Susie had a good point about another collection point. Do you want to speak, add in, jump in? I think you might be muted if you're trying to talk. No. Oh, okay. Um, Susie was just saying that when they were food assembly, they used to, um, a local pub as a collection of the land. Um, yeah, so it, uh, the landlord liked football. Like the, oh, no, like the extra football. I thought it said football. I was like, why do you want football? What's that to do with it? But yeah, I can see why he'd like the extra football um, when people come to collect their shopping as well as going in for a pint. Yeah. So definitely. Um, so I think we've sort of come to an almost natural end. Um, I'll hand back to um, Kay. Great, that's perfect timing. We just a few minutes to go to quarter two. So thank you so much um, to everybody who's come today, especially to the, yeah, the wonderful food enterprises who've come and shared their story and experience. Um, it's so useful to have this space where we can share the lessons and experience from the pandemic so far and really hope as well that this yeah these kinds of spaces will um give us more tools to be able to deal with more restrictions if and when they come so thanks so much for that and thanks for everyone that's asked questions today um it's really great that we've all been able to kind of learn from each other in this way and i feel like i've learned so much from from everyone who spoke today so thank you um just to say that I saw with the couple of marketing questions that came up, um, we've got a Facebook group called the Thriving Food Hub. There's a wealth of marketing um, support materials in there if, if you're interested in joining. It's really easy to find on Facebook, just search Thriving Food Hub um, and it will come up. And yeah, please join. It's a really open space. You can ask questions and get almost kind of group feedback as well. Um, a little bit like, like this webinar. And the next webinar we'll be running next week is going to be um, about a different topic. It's more of a one-to-one -one with Tamar, um, Tamar Valley Food Hubs. So we'll be doing a bit of a week in the life of session with Sarah Rock, which will be really interesting and exciting. So I um, hope to see some of you there for that one. And um, the one after that at the beginning of uh, November will be all about Christmas 2020 and preparing your food hub for that on an operational side of things as well as a marketing side of things so just a bit about what to expect in the future um so yeah thank you so much uh, everyone for, for contributing to the space um it's really appreciated i hope i hope everyone's gained something from it too so i hope you all have a lovely evening 
and thank you and and see you again thank you thank very you. much it's been great awesome. thank nice you. to hear from everyone thanks love you thank you thank you and stay okay. safe bye, bye. Thanks for coming.